in a race against the Nazis, and I know what it means. If the Nazis have a bomb, we imagine a future, and our imaginings horrify us. I don't know if we can be trusted with such a weapon, but we have no choice. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, today we're going to be exploring Christopher Nolan's recently released historical drama, Oppenheimer. Based on the 2005 biography, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin, Nolan gives us a cerebral deep dive into the tumultuous life of theoretical physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, the key architect of the Manhattan Project and the infamous harbinger of the atomic age. Starring Killian Murphy as J. Robert Oppenheimer, Emily Blunt as his wife Catherine, Matt Damon as General Leslie Groves, Oppenheimer's stiff-lipped military handler, and Robert Downey Jr. as Louis Strauss, the hawkish senior member of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. True to Nolan's style, Oppenheimer is not a straightforward linear narrative. Instead, the star-studded film's timeline jumps about like a quantum particle, oscillating between Oppenheimer's journey from Cambridge to Los Alamos, his security hearing in 1954, and Strauss's confirmation hearing in 1959. In this video, we're going to explore the real-life history of J. Robert Oppenheimer, Nolan's biopic, the alternate timelines, and the meaning of its ending. Dr. Oppenheimer, you and many like you who brought the bomb into being still seem to suffer from a bad conscience about it. Is that true, sir? We had the pride of thinking we knew what was good for man. I do think it has left a mark on many of those who were responsibly engaged. I believe we had a great cause to do this, but I do not think that our consciences should be entirely easy. When you play a meaningful part, bringing about the death of over 100,000 people, you don't think of that with ease. This is not the natural business of a scientist. J. Robert Oppenheimer was an American theoretical physicist who, during his involvement in the Manhattan Project, served as director of the Los Alamos Laboratory. He essentially spearheaded the research and design of the atomic bomb, earning him the moniker, the father of the atomic bomb. Born on April 22, 1904, to Julius S. Oppenheimer, a wealthy German textile merchant, and Ella Friedman, an artist, his academic prowess became evident early, with him diving into minerals, physics, and chemistry by the age of 10. His advanced correspondence with the New York Mineralogical Club even led to an invitation for a lecture. Unbeknownst to the society, Oppenheimer was merely 12 years old at the time. Despite a brush with a potentially lethal bout of dysentery, after graduating as valedictorian from his high school, Oppenheimer regained his health during a summer in New Mexico and subsequently enrolled at Harvard in 1922. During his undergraduate studies, he excelled in Latin, Greek, physics and chemistry, published poetry and even studied Eastern philosophy. Excelling in the various subjects, he graduated in three years, and although he majored in chemistry, his true passion lay in the study of physics. And so, in 1925, Oppenheimer began his graduate work in physics at Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Under the mentorship of J.J. Thompson, the 1906 Nobel Prize recipient in physics, Oppenheimer realized his calling lay in theoretical physics, leading to an invitation to study with Max Born at the University of Göttingen in Germany. Fortuitously, he found himself in Europe during a pivotal time in the physics world, amidst the birth of quantum mechanics. After receiving his doctorate in 1927, he accepted professorships at the University of California, Berkeley, and the California Institute of Technology. At Berkeley, his close friendship with Ernest Lawrence, a leading experimental physicist and the cyclotron inventor, led to Lawrence naming his second son after Robert. In the bustling 1920s, the scientific world was riveted by the cutting-edge theories of quantum mechanics and relativity. The notion that mass was essentially equivalent to energy, and that matter could exhibit both wave and particle-like properties, was something still being comprehended. His initial research delved into the energy processes involving subatomic particles, encapsulating electrons, positrons, and cosmic rays. Furthermore, he ventured into pioneering work related to neutron stars and black holes. Given that quantum theory had been introduced only a few years prior, he found himself in the prime position at the university to devote his entire career to unraveling and amplifying its profound implications. 
Beyond his research, he also left a considerable imprint on the world of physics education, training a generation of US physicists, imparting to them not only knowledge, but also the values of leadership and intellectual autonomy. By 1936, Oppenheimer fell into a complex romance with Jean Tatlock, the intellectually dynamic daughter of a Berkeley literature professor and herself a student at Stanford University School of Medicine. Their shared political inclinations, both leaning to the left, with Tatlock penning for the Western Worker, a Communist Party publication, fueled their mutual attraction. However, in 1939, after a turbulent on-and-off liaison, Tatlock decided to sever ties with Oppenheimer. It was in that very year he found himself entangled with another radical flame, Catherine Kitty Puning, an ex-Communist Party member and a spirited Berkeley student, marking the beginning of a complicated, troubled, yet consequential chapter in both of their lives. Their firstborn Peter arrived in May 1941, and their daughter Catherine Tony followed in December 1944, born amid the secluded confines of Los Alamos, New Mexico. By the initiation of the Manhattan Project in 1942, Oppenheimer had already cemented his reputation as a formidable theoretical physicist, heavily immersed in atomic bomb research. His work effectively revolved around fast neutrons, the material quantities needed for a bomb and its potential efficiency. And so, despite his lack of managerial experience and potentially troublesome past associations with communist causes, Oppenheimer's profound scientific acumen was apparent to General Leslie Groves. Less than three years after Groves entrusted Oppenheimer with weapons development, the US utilized two atomic bombs in Japan, Looking back now, do you think that our country's use of the bomb was necessary? The war had started in 39. It seen the death of tens of millions, brutality and degradation, which had no place in the middle of the 20th century. And the ending of the war by this means, certainly cruel, was not undertaken lightly. But I am not confident that a better course was then open. In the aftermath of the war, he transitioned into an advisory role for the Atomic Energy Commission, advocating for international arms control. By 1947, he took the helm of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Here, he assembled a who's who of the scientific community, fostering an environment ripe for groundbreaking discussions and discoveries, adopting the mantra, what we don't understand, we explain to each other. However, his story took a turn during the second Red Scare in 1954, when his security clearance was abruptly revoked during a hearing. The shadow of his past communist sympathies was rekindled, and his clearance was suspended just 32 hours before its scheduled expiration. By resisting the development of the hydrogen bomb, Oppenheimer had gathered a fair share of political adversaries, and this move effectively eliminated his political clout. The scientific community was up in arms over his treatment, with particular disdain directed at Louis Strauss and Edward Teller, who testified against him at the hearing. By 1960, Along with luminaries such as Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell, and Joseph Rotblat, Oppenheimer established the World Academy of Art and Science. We live in a very unusual world, marked by great and irreversible changes that occur within the span of one man's life. We live in a time where our knowledge and understanding of the world of nature grows wider, broader, and deeper with unparalleled speed and scope, and where the problems of applying this knowledge to man's needs and man's hopes are very new and only a little illuminated by our past history. Continuing to deliver lectures worldwide, he was recognized with the Enrico Fermi Award in 1963. His journey came to an end in 1967, when he'd succumbed to throat cancer. After Hiroshima, you pointed out that nuclear weapons, as you put it, would lead to new patterns of behavior. Well, why has that hope failed of realization? There are a hundred reasons for seeing no hope at all. It's harder to think of anything on the other side, and they do exist, and they look to me like a bridgehead to a livable future. The film isn't just a simple biopic. It's a double helix of a story with intertwined timelines titled Fission and Fusion. Fission is in vibrant color, and it's where we follow our main man, J. Robert Oppenheimer. On the other hand, Fusion strips it down to black and white and offers us a view of Oppenheimer through the lens of Louis Strauss. Of course, it wouldn't be a Nolan film without a healthy dose of convoluted storytelling. So within these two timelines, we've got flashbacks and flash forwards before the two timelines tango with each other at the end. In essence, the film revolves around one of the most critical ventures in human history, the Manhattan Project, with Robert navigating the world of politics, science and war as he oversaw the creation of the first atomic bombs. In 1954, we see Oppenheimer testifying before a committee, his security clearance hanging in the balance. 
Without this clearance, his influence on nuclear policy would be significantly reduced. And with his mixed feelings about creating the atom bombs that pulverized Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this threatens his ability to deter the eagerness of those that wanted to continue making more weapons of mass destruction. Fast forward to 1959, we see Louis Strauss wrestling with his past association with Oppenheimer, as he strives to be confirmed as the Eisenhower administration's Secretary of Commerce. The 1954 timeline is shown in this stark, desaturated palette, almost as if Oppenheimer's reality is slowly being stripped of its vibrancy. On the flip side, the 1959 timeline is stark black and white. Nolan is effectively using color, or the lack thereof, to distinguish between Oppenheimer's intimate viewpoint and the colder, more detached perspective of the wider world bearing down on him. So now the race is against the Soviets. Not unless we start it. Robert, they just fired a starting gun. As Oppenheimer testifies, we're then taken to 1924, when he was just a Cambridge lad under the wing of Patrick Blackett, played by James Darcy. In a rebellious fit to get back at Blackett for being harsh on him, including forcing him to stay late and nearly miss a lecture by Niels Bohr, he doses his teacher's apple with potassium cyanide. Luckily, in a discussion between Blackett and Bohr after the lecture, Oppenheimer stops Bohr from eating the deadly fruit and impresses him with his mind, earning him a golden ticket to a less restrictive education. We then find him at the University of Gottingen, making friends with Isidore Rabi, portrayed by David Krumholtz, and meeting the man he idolizes most, theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg. Back stateside at Berkeley, where he's affectionately known as Oppie by his peers, the scientist begins to rub shoulders with Nobel Prize laureate Ernest Lawrence, portrayed by Josh Hartnett. It's here that Oppenheimer's theories are tempered by Lawrence's practical work. His revolutionary lecture room on quantum mechanics starts with just one eager beaver, Giovanni Lominitz, but it's not long until many are blown away with his radical notions. Things then start to get a bit spicy when Oppenheimer dives into the communist pool attending a party with his brother Frank, played by Dylan Arnold, and his girlfriend, who were being wooed by ideology. There he first crosses paths with Florence Pugh's Jean Tatlock, culminating in a passionate yet unhealthy relationship. While not fully donning the red hat like his brother, despite the advice of Lawrence to leave politics out of the science, Oppenheimer leans enough to the left to raise some eyebrows, especially when he supports the Spanish Revolution and makes an appearance at the Federation of Architects, Engineers, Chemists and Technicians, fueling the communist speculations. The tranquility of his work is then shattered by news of the Germans splitting the uranium nucleus and Hitler's invasion of Poland. At the same time, the realization of the massive destructive capabilities that his field of study would unlock starts to infect his mind. Enter Catherine Kitty Puny, played by Emily Blunt, a commie with a failing marriage that Oppie takes a liking to. Unlike Jean, who had a love-hate relationship with Oppenheimer and seemed to almost despise him, Kitty ends up being a firecracker of support in his most trying of times. In comes Matt Damon's General Leslie Groves and his sidekick, Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Nichols, played by Dane DeHaan, with an offer the boastful Oppenheimer can't refuse to direct the Manhattan Project and create a bomb before the Germans, who were 18 months ahead. Who could resist the opportunity to work with some of the greatest minds of his generation, including, but not limited to Feynman, Bainbridge, Neddermeyer, Teller, Hornig, Lominitz, and Alvarez? Under the supervision of Groves, they bring all the families together and set up a cozy fake town near the testing site in Los Alamos, where they realized there was a small chance that their bomb could light a fire that engulfed the world. While not sure if they could be trusted with such a weapon, considering what the Germans were doing to his people, Oppenheimer is emboldened by the fact that the Nazis couldn't. The research that followed dropped the chances of total annihilation to near zero, but this is all theory, and they agree that the only way they'll ever be sure is when they use it. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Fast forward to a security hearing, where Oppenheimer's involvement with Chevalier, a friend and communist member that helped raise their son, get some attention. Allegations of communist leanings and treason are making his life hell, and the situation gets further tangled when Colonel Boris Pash, the project's head of security and a vehement anti-communist, enters the scene. Adding fuel to the fire, Oppenheimer's past affair with Jean comes to light, and he's forced to admit his adultery with Kitty present in the room. Worse yet, the confidential nature of the accusations and backroom trial meant Oppenheimer and his lawyer were not entitled to disclosure, putting them on the back foot the entire time. Although it's clear this is a kangaroo court he had no chance of winning against, it's not until the end that we discover who'd orchestrated the whole affair. We also learn about Jean's tragic end by suicide, with the guilt of this causing Oppenheimer to suffer a mental breakdown. Despite being furious about his infidelity, Kitty encourages him to pull himself together and get back to work, as others were depending on him, including his now growing family. After escaping Nazi-occupied Europe, during the project's development, Bohr is brought to Los Alamos, leaving Oppenheimer and Teller with a chilling thought. 
they're effectively handing mankind the power to destroy themselves. While news of Hitler's fall leaves the world celebrating, with American troops preparing to engage the Japanese in another lengthy conflict, the Manhattan Project continues. Here, Oppenheimer and his colleagues begin to worry, with the scientists stating, They won't fear it until they understand it, and they won't understand it until they've used it. Theory will take you only so far. Still, despite Groves pushing the deadline forward under pressure from the president, following a number of tests, they make the perfect bomb. The Trinity test is set into motion, and we get an absolute spectacle of a mushroom cloud lighting up the night, where Oppenheimer, basking in the eerie glow, delivers that bone-chilling line, and now I'm become death, the destroyer of worlds. While most of the troops and scientists are celebrating, some are throwing up, crying, and with even Oppenheimer himself starting to get plagued by visions of nuclear holocaust. And to Gary Oldman's president, Harry Truman, who gives the go-ahead for the two atomic bombs to be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the first to show the weapon's power, the second, to prove that they would keep using them until Japan surrendered. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. It is an atomic bomb. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. The uranium bomb detonated over Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945 had an explosive yield equal to about 20,000 tons of TNT. It raised and burnt around 70% of all buildings and caused an estimated 140,000 deaths by the end of 1945, along with increased rates of cancer and chronic disease among the survivors. A slightly larger plutonium bomb exploded over Nagasaki three days later, leveling 6.7 square kilometers of the city, with ground temperatures reaching 4,000 degrees Celsius and radioactive rain pouring down, killing 74,000 people by the end of the year. It's a victory laced with a sickening realization of what they've done, and the human cost begins to gnaw at Oppenheimer's conscience. So much so that Oppenheimer's meeting with Truman, initially jubilant, ends with him getting kicked out for his guilt-ridden comments. You see, Truman believed that while Oppie built the bomb, it would be him that the Japanese hated. The narrative then skips to the Senate hearings years later, and we get some grim updates. Frank's blacklisted, Luminitz is working on Railroad, and Chevalier, who once took care of Oppie's boy, had gone into exile. In the midst of this, Oppenheimer tries to push for arms control, believing he'd open Pandora's box. Unfortunately, he's met with Truman's rejection. To add fuel to the fire, Strauss drops the bombshell that Klaus Fuchs, one of the Manhattan Project team, was actually a spy for the Soviet Union during and shortly after World War II. Christopher Nolan's portrayal of Oppenheimer doesn't shy away from the harsh realities of the man's psyche. The film drags us into the relentless existential dread that Oppenheimer wrestles with, leading us on a precarious tightrope walk for three hours. This tension is further compounded by the post-war interrogations, as Oppenheimer's American loyalty is probed and tested. Of course, his subsequent opposition to the hydrogen bomb post-World War II raised hackles among the power-hungry. Throughout the security hearing, where everyone involved in the project is summoned to give testimony, Kitty grows increasingly frustrated with Oppenheimer's self-destructive tendencies and his refusal to fight back telling him that letting them tar and feather him will not ensure the world forgave him. The question of Oppenheimer's loyalty is put to the test, and despite the final verdict of the board being that they believed he was loyal to America, he's stripped of his security clearance and loses all of his political influence. The two timelines finally connect when we discover that Strauss was the man pulling the strings behind the committee, reviewing Oppenheimer's security clearance. Outwardly a friend, he's been nursing a grudge against Oppenheimer for years. The source of Strauss's resentment well, the film hints at two incidents. One when Oppenheimer supposedly sows Albert Einstein against Strauss, and the other, a meeting where Oppenheimer humiliates Strauss in front of his scientific colleagues. But Karma's a bitch, and she catches up with Strauss in 59. His past grudge against Oppenheimer takes center stage during his Senate confirmation, when news of his nefarious attempts to destroy the career of fellow scientists is revealed, leading to his downfall. The film then takes us back to the pivotal conversation between Oppenheimer and Einstein, and here's the kicker, they weren't chatting about Strauss at all. Instead, it's Oppenheimer's cold dread at the monstrous power that unleashed on the world that disturbed Einstein so much that he'd ignored Strauss, which the vain man interpreted as a slight. In Tenet, time itself was a doomsday weapon, yet there was a glimmer of hope that it could be disarmed. Oppenheimer counters that optimism with a stark reality. The atomic bomb can't be unmade, with its further use held at bay only by the fear of mutually assured destruction. The film finally concludes with Oppenheimer receiving the Enrico Fermi Award from President Lyndon B. Johnson. The final vision of nukes going off across the globe, turning it to fire and ash, is a stark reminder of the Pandora's box they've opened. Our work here will ensure peace mankind is never seen. I'm just somebody who's a big bomb.
In typical Nolan fashion, Oppenheimer creatively mixes intricate personal drama with grand-scale consequences, creating a thought-provoking examination of ambition, guilt, and the ethical implications of scientific advancement. The juxtaposition of the Technicolor ride dubbed fission with the black and white fusion is more than just a narrative device. It's a physics lesson with a side of imminent disaster. Hungarian physicist Edward Teller introduces the idea of a hydrogen bomb, not just as a weapon of mass destruction, but essentially a weapon of mass genocide. Fission, splitting an atom's nucleus in two, unleashed enough power to flatten Hiroshima and Nagasaki, reflecting the work of Oppenheimer. But fusion, the merging of two light nuclei, well, that's a whole other level of catastrophic and something that was championed by Strauss. Oppenheimer is a walking paradox. He's a man fascinated by the incongruities of nature, wrestling with his own ideals of creating this death-bringing instrument, both for saving and taking lives. His character is riddled with conflict. He's on shaky ground, and yet he doesn't collapse under the weight of these contradictions and paradoxes. Then we've got Strauss, portrayed as a man driven by ego, with a greedy eye on power. He's supportive of the H-bomb and nonchalant about its devastating potential casualties. His pursuit of power aims to accumulate prestige for his country and, by extension, himself, consuming him with vanity and self-obsession. Nolan reminds us repeatedly and rather uncomfortably of the apocalyptic nature of both types of power and the minuscule yet existent chance of these causing total annihilation. It's a personal film on Oppenheimer's life, while simultaneously a public statement about the terrifying and destructive capacity of human ambition. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves, and the world is not prepared. The film is a cinematic tour de force in acting, boasting a star-studded lineup that shine in every frame. Killian Murphy steals the show, delivering an unforgettable portrayal of the man himself, communicating deep, devastating emotions. You feel the weight of his accomplishments, trials and tribulations in the nuanced performance. Emily Blunt is solid as his wife Catherine Kitty Oppenheimer, a troubled woman that serves as his only anchor during the chaos, while Matt Damon is brilliant as Oppenheimer's stern, intelligent and witty superior. His arrival was a welcome one, as the movie really starts to get going when he's thrown into the mix. Tom Conti leaves an indelible impression as Albert Einstein, a genius passing on the torch of worry that come from the unseen ramifications of their work to Oppenheimer. Florence Pugh is okay in a limited screen time as Gene Tatlock, if not on the same note, while Jack Quaid, Benny Safdie, Kenneth Branagh, Josh Hartnett, Casey Affleck, Gary Oldman, Matthew Modine, Rami Malek, Dane DeHaan, Alden Einrich, Jason Clarke, David Dismalchian, and Olivia Thirdly, among many more, are nothing short of exceptional as their real-life counterparts. However, it's Robert Downey Jr. who delivers the most astonishing supporting performance as Louis Strauss, matching the intensity and magnetism of Killian Murphy's Oppenheimer. Downey, almost exclusively featured in monochrome scenes, is splendidly hideous as a counterforce to Murphy, playing the conniving, egotistical, and spiteful character with ease. Despite rarely sharing any screen time, the clash of their characters is palpable. The Russians have a bomb. We're supposed to be years ahead of them, but... What were you guys doing in Los Alamos? Reuniting with Nolan, Ludwig Göransson provides a throbbing, immersive musical backbone to Oppenheimer. Each sound and instrument is masterfully employed to maximize emotional impact and scale, with the locomotive soundscape making it feel like we're on a non-stop train of inevitability. With that said, though not as bad as Tenet, there were some parts where the music overpowered the scenes in quiet moments that would have benefited from the weight of silence. The stellar cinematography by Hoyt van Hoytema imbues every frame with a purpose and complements Nolan's use of practical effects. It deftly captures the monumental size of the operation and the varying landscapes and locations, while balancing this with a more intimate look into the profound complexities of Oppenheimer's reluctant deification. Jennifer Lame's razor-sharp editing also shines, ensuring Oppenheimer moves at a breathtaking pace and impressive feat given the film's non-linear narrative and daunting three-hour runtime. Interlacing scenes of atomic collisions visually fragment Oppenheimer's reality, revealing a fresh perspective into his mind and simultaneously heightening the tension, with each shot hinting at the impending disaster. Though I have to say it could have been cut down from three hours, Nolan's Oppenheimer is a combustible feat of cinema that ignites existential and moral questions that humanity is still grappling with. Would the Japanese surrender if they knew what was coming? With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Oppenheimer. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained.
Thanks for stopping by. Why would we go to the middle of nowhere for who knows how long? Why? How about because this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world? World War II would be over. Our boys would come home. That's happening, isn't it? The world will remember this day until somebody builds a bigger one. Two, 